Good morning or good afternoon, Keith. Good afternoon, Eric. Thank you so much for taking a moment out of the many things, the many very wonderful things you're doing in your life to talk with me and those who will listen. And um, the reason I'm reaching out to you is that you know a thing or two about folk art in the world, and I love that theme. And I have recently received this in the mail, <laughs> which is fresh off the presses, this beautiful new book that, that you've just written about color and dyes and all things related. And I wanna ask you how this book came into being, but before I do that, if you don't mind, I'd like to read the first paragraph of the introduction, which Please. is absolutely gorgeous. And I think that um, all should hear it. And I think that also hearing it, those of you listening, it ought to tempt you into getting the rest of this book to read as well. <laughs> As a child, I was convinced that Crayola made a mistake. Ma magenta should have been spelled Magneta. In recognition of the radiant magnetic powers it deploys to penetrate the eyes and reach deep into the brain, it was one of many colors that spoke to me in their own voices about their own meanings, carrying their own smells, flavors, and sounds. Chrome yellows burst forward like a trumpet call with brassy notes of optimism and overconfidence. You danced to their tune at, your, at some peril. Dark forest green sounded like oboes, wise, but rather shy as they quietly revealed what was hiding in the shadows. You could trust them, but you had to listen very closely. Chartreuse tasted sharp like an exotic citrus and talked fast with the trickster voice of the violin's uppermost notes. Blood reds were salty and metallic like blood itself, intoning sensuality and warming in the inexorable voice of the piano's lowest octave a motif throbbing constantly in the background like a living pulse. You're writing about crayons <laughs> <laughs> and color <laughs> and depths of deliciousness. So, well, that's how it was for me. Yeah. I, it was always like taking a big bath. Um, all of it hit me all at once, all the time. And I, and I understood intuitively that that wasn't how it was for other people. And yeah. so I knew, you know, not to talk about it. Uh, but it was still there. It was still there being experienced all the time. And um, it really set me off on a path of not just uh, enjoying and absorbing color, but also um, wanting to write about it. Because all that mixture of sounds and smells and tastes and, and visuals, you know, it had to, I had to do something with it. Yes. And you did. <laughs> this book being one thing, but I think there's a lifetime story around colors, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's true. It's true. Yeah, so I ended up studying poetry in school, uh, writing it, and I studied literature in graduate school. And of course, I had to go into retail after getting those degrees because what else could I do? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up working uh, as director of home furnishings at Saks Fifth Avenue, Gump, San Francisco, and Bloomingdale's. And out of that work, you know, I, I became so aware of, you know, the supply and demand equation and who was being left out of it. Uh, and I got involved with people that we know through Aid to Artisans and the International Folk Art Market and starting my own nonprofit called Hand Eye Fund, which, which is Hand Eye Magazine, uh, because I wanted to learn to use those sort of, you know, I call them my evil retail skills. I wanted to use them for good. Uh -huh. to help people who were being excluded um, find a way into the marketplace that was good for them, right? That didn't ruin their lives that instead brought them additional income that put them in the way of progress and improvement on their terms yeah. by making the things that they really liked uh, on a schedule that they really could use in their own homes and their own lives with their other responsibilities uh, and it's been a great life i think uh, because of getting involved with that uh, it changed my life entirely and do you feel like the seed of that is this 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 unique, I'm going to call it shamanic, <laughs> understanding of color and fascination with color? Yeah, the, the color the color thing was definitely the beginning of my my being compelled to be a, an observer, a, a close observer of what was going on, right? And and I think one of the reasons I was so interested in the people who were not included in the you know, the, the exchange of trade going on every day in front of us in the United States is because I missed their voices, right? The minute you become exposed to this beauty, you want more of it. And you wonder why everybody 
he's not clamoring for it. Right. But yeah. So I had to sort of close that gap somehow. And uh, yeah, I feel good that, you know, I started this, I started this journey almost 30 years ago, uh, mostly because of meeting Claire Smith, right? If you remember Claire from Ada Artisans. Yeah. Um, mostly because of meeting her, I realized it was possible to put those two pieces together, right? The, what was going on in the rest of the world, quote unquote, and what was going on in my business life, those things could be put together because it was always her premise that if you give people the, the chance to compete honorably, they could make it. And time and time again, we see that that's true. And over the course of 30 years, you know, we see more and more people being given an honorable chance to make it and making it and more and more customers sort of understanding what that brings into their lives. And it's in that joining that you have so much, so much beauty and progress and goodness really that, that can unfold. So Claire serves as, is, is a tremendous role model, uh, a spark to that recognition that you see between connecting what you're doing at Saks Fifth Avenue, which, which seems like such an excellent training ground yes. because I mean, you're in the thick of it, right? You're absolutely in the thick of our retail world and yes. then being able to under to take that knowledge and bridge it and take it out into the rest of the gorgeous world with, with a very specific skill set unique to America yes. that has a great deal to contribute in the best way, yes. also in ways that aren't the best way, but it can be used in the best way yes. um, for these communities, these artisans, these people that you're speaking about. Yes, it's true. It's true. It can be used in the best way. You know, over the almost 30 years, I think it's 28 and a half years uh, of being involved, um, you see that certain modifications have to be made, right? You see the whole concept of deadlines can be completely irrelevant depending on your context for seasonal reasons, for family reasons, for available resource reasons. Uh, you also see that you know, part of our retail experience, our commercial experience, involves an infinite supply of newness all the time. Right. Right. And so you start to see some of the limitations that that could impose on opportunity. But then you also see the possibility to build up some skill sets to cope with all of that, too. So it's it's a never ending, super fascinating kaleidoscope. Right. To yes. try to bring those things together with dignity and fairness and opportunity for everybody. This infinite, this infinite availability and desire for newness, it, it, it strikes me as, as such a cultural, what will I call it? I'll generously call it a cultural current or trend. And at the same, and as we speak about artisans that, that we work with in different places, newness is something that's very, very slowly undertaken and brought forward. And what's more constant is, constants and that this this is the way we do something slowly rolling it forward slowly rolling it forward and i feel like there is there is a lot that we're hungry for in this country um around you know the slow foods and the slow arts and that an artisan a craftsperson a person who represents a culture that has a very different way of approaching existence than we do has a great deal to model for us and that some of us have our ears wide open to that and we're like oh it doesn't have to be new every month every yeah. season it yeah. could there could be a steadiness to it i hate to sound like you know um, a version of yoda but um lack of newness is the new newness <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true That's beautiful <laughs> 50 years 50 years of endless newness in the modern marketplace, right? It's, it's just too much. It's, it's even, it verges on monotonous because of the constant noise that it presents you, right? So the idea of stepping back and watching something age a little bit over time as you use it becomes a Zen kind of newness, right? Yeah. The idea of taking, say, something I know we both love, uh, terracotta, handmade terracotta pottery, and slowly becoming a little more expert about what it is and why it is and how it's made and who makes it and slowly building more of that into your experience. That's a different kind of newness, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost like um, what people used to call connoisseurship where yeah. you're building that knowledge, maybe at the same time as possession, but maybe more at the same time as experience 
Uh, and that's what is your constant newness. It's going deeper. It's going deeper, right? The, 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 the newness of something profound, right. the newness of a quiet space inside in a noisy world, yeah. which, is, which is part, I think, of why we like to hold anything handmade, that, yeah. that clay vessel that you're speaking about. Ah. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> There's a right. nice, deep sort of soul sigh that can be found in holding that piece. So true. It's so true. I, I have a couple of um, uh, Navajo pieces from the Southwest, right? And uh, they're not far from where I'm sitting right now. And occasionally in the middle of a really maybe mind bending conference call, I will just go and hold one while I continue to listen to thinking, okay, <laughs> here's, my an here's my antidote. Yes, yeah. yes, right on. This beats the heck out of Tylenol or Advil. Let me hold this piece of an old culture in the Southwest and yeah. And I, I have tried those. I have tried the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the pottery works better. Some, sometimes, so, certain medicines at certain times. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Everything at a correct time. That's exactly right. How, what was, um, for, for this, for the book True Colors, the, the seed goes back to the way that you were born and evolved as a human child, but um, more recently, how did that how did that begin? Well, you know, I, I have to be I have to be super honest, right? Uh, the idea actually started with food um, because I had a consultation with an Ayurvedic astrologist who told me that my combination of zodiac sign and the structure of my planets meant that I would never be thin. So I, <laughs> I, felt, the need, <laughs> I felt the need to do some thinking about food, and in reading and doing a little researching, you know, because I I like that. Um, I realized that the slow food movement and the farm to table food movement created such a difference in how we perceive what we eat from a source point of view, from a person point of view, right? We more and more want to buy directly from the person who's growing it. We want to know why they chose those seeds. I think we're even fascinated now with chefs who are breeding their own seeds, right? To create sort of the best version of something they really love. We are now capable of, doing something that I know wasn't happening at the grocery store when I was a kid. Right. Which was really finding food that suited your passion, not your habit. Right. And I started to think that that also has affected us at a policy level. The phrase food desert was certainly not something we talked about when I was a kid or even maybe 10 years ago. It's a new concept. It's a new way of addressing some of the problems that our society faces through the lens of food. And I started to think, well, wow, I love color and textiles and folk art. Why can't the product marketplace, the consumer marketplace, evolve to a higher consciousness about what we touch and wear, what we spend almost every moment of our, of our lives surrounded by, right, textiles? We need to improve how we see that, what we ask of the people who design, make, and sell these things that we have on our backs or surround us like towels and sheets and the, we sit on them at night, right? When we're relaxing, we need to be more evolved consumers in order to push that system into a better place. And the need to push that system into a better place is pretty severe. Uh, there's an anecdote that the fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world behind oil extraction and mining. And there's some dispute about that. It may not be second, but if it's third or fourth, yeah, it's up there. It's up there. And we're the force that's driving that forward. If we change, it changes. And so I really started to think, okay, through a lens of color, before 1856, with the invention of the first synthetic dye, mm -hmm. our ancestors understood how to get color from plant material, from insects, from snails, uh, they knew so much more about what the natural world was bringing them than we do today. And if we could return to some appreciation, I mean, obviously we can't become our great grandparents, but if we could return to some of that appreciation about what's possible in a low infrastructure, low impact context, that also has the potential to do a lot of good for people as well as planet, could we not force this industry to evolve just as the food industry continues to evolve? Mm. Wow. We have it in us, we have that power. 
So I, through the 26 stories that are told in the book, I'm really hoping it opens up a, a way for people to say, I can't buy a $5.99 t-shirt because it simply doesn't represent how I want to be in this world, right? right. There's this, another statistic that I read um, that 80% of the clothing we buy ends up in landfill within one year. And for me, that's certainly linked to, you know, the idea that we always want new things, but it also is linked to the high probability that what we're buying has been designed with only the terribly minimal virtues of a disposable thing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Quality is not good. It has no meaning. It has no story. It has no durability. It has little quality. And yet it still sucks up all the resources it takes to make it, right? Right. But on its face and after two washes in the laundry, it looks like garbage because it is. Right. And if we become unwilling to accept that, then the system has to change. Right. This, I, I love this parallel. I hadn't thought of it, Keith, and this is a world that I spend a lot of time in. But the parallel that you're making between the transition that's happening with the food world, the slow food movement, much more awareness about organic and farm to table and farmer's market, and that a bridge could be made that we can be inspired by that success into the world of, of clothing and the dyes that go into clothing, the fibers. Uh, that's really beautiful. And... Yeah. And so that is, in addition to what your astrologer said, that is the, <laughs> I'm not sure which has more weight here. <laughs> a little salt in the wound to use a food metaphor. <laughs> but that is the genesis of, of this book, True Colors, then. Yes, it is. Right, it all came together, right? This, this thing about color and this love of textiles and folk art joined with the need for people to really see what they're doing right now in a different way, right? To meet the challenges that are before us in terms of saving the health of our planet, right? This was a moment, there was an urgency, there was a reason to write this book now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really how it started. And, and the many stories that are in the book, because the book is chapters about different dyers, different colors from around the world, each, each is a different tradition. How did you find, how did you select? There's a lot to choose from out there. There's a lot to choose from out there. Um, you know, it really comes from these past 30 years by and large. You know, most of these folks are people. So for example, Fatilo Kenjaev from Uzbekistan is somebody that I met in 1999 on my first trip to Uzbekistan, right? Yeah. Because he's been seriously pursuing his discipline of natural dyeing and teaching um, since the, just after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, so on through all of the years since then, um, yeah, it's, an, it's a beautiful accumulation of life. Uh, yeah. And, and some new, new people too, right? Because as I started to kind of, you know, people are so eager, so beautifully eager to share, right, what they know. Yeah. Like, oh my God, if that's what you're doing, then you have to call this person or you should really research this person. And the next thing you know, you know, there are a handful of people in the book who are brand new to me. Um, you know, there's a, a young woman working in the sphere of New York City uh, to use turmeric as one of her most predominant dyes. And her reasons for doing that have a lot to do with the health benefits of turmeric. Uh -huh. Thinking that perhaps if we surround ourselves with molecules that actually do the body good instead of petrochemical derivatives, right, we might actually promote some greater sense of health in ourselves in addition to moving away from some of the polluting colorants that we use. There are people who are a little skeptical about that, you know, saying that once a substance binds to the fiber, it's no longer available for absorption into the skin. But I am taking a uh, probably super crazy, weird uh, quantum physics look at this. Here, here. In physics, right? In quantum physics, there are no borders. There are only probabilities, right? So here my hand is more probably in contact with air and here my, my hand is more probably in contact with wool protein, right? Well, I'll go for the probabilities of being in closer contact with turmeric than a petrochemical any day. <laughs> I'll take it. Right? That's not too hard to figure that one out. I have an entire agreement. But, but what I know about turmeric is that if I spill any of it on my counter, it stains for ages. Which oh, forever. The probability of contact transfer is real. And I'll be yellow. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you might be lightly yellow. And in fact, um, you know, you're touching on something that is, for me, uh, one of the learnings that's come about since the release of the book. Um, the dyers, natural dyers of my age and maybe up, actually don't like the fact that I have written about somebody who uses turmeric as a dye. Mm. Because turmeric is not particularly wash fast in a fiber context, right? And they say, they, and I'm really super interested in this dialogue. I, I'm, I'm learning every day from it. They say that, that the reputation of natural dyeing is cheapened when you talk about something like turmeric, which doesn't have the same performance as indigo when it's well done, or matter when it's well done, or weld when it's well done. But my response is that people of my age and a little bit older came around at a time when natural dyeing was like this crazy fringe thing that hippies did. Right. The dialogue, the debate was really, are natural dyes just as good as synthetic dyes? And that's where you get into this performance issue. Perfectly valid, legit dialogue, fantastically good, interesting. But right now, given where we are socially and creatively, the question is, what harm am I doing to the planet? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So if my turmeric sweatshirt from Audrey Louise Reynolds fades after three washings, well, what happens if I just throw it back into the pot of turmeric, you know, right? Six teaspoons of turmeric in a bath of hot water and I'm fresh again. And for me, I love coming at this from both of those points of view. Yeah. Right? Is it superior or, or equal in performance? Or is it low impact? Or can we head to some blending of both? And I'm fascinated with the back and forth. Do I have all the answers? Absolutely not, right? The more you know, the less you know. Oh, yeah. uh, sure. So, but I'm, I'm super interested in seeing this uh, interaction between two totally different points of view in the natural dying world. Fascinating, fascinating, right. They are, they are dialogues that come out of certain eras. Yes. And we know now that natural dyes um, can be tremendously color fast and that for, for more reasons than that are on par with and actually superior to synthetics because yes. we have a planet to work at, to look after. Right. And, right. and then, and then this idea of recharging your dye and if your dye is something like turmeric and that there is at least some probability that that's contributing something to um, less in, in inflammation in your muscle tissue or something like that. This brings up the idea of clothing as medicine, medicine, which is, I mean, you know. Right. right. <laughs> and the other, the other interesting thing, um, you know, about some of the new stuff that I'm writing about in the book, uh, in addition to, you know, indigo, which clearly has been around for archaeologically 6,200 years, but come on, it has to have been around for much longer than that. Sure. Uh, in addition to those ancient things, um, so we've got some idea of healing substances. We've got the idea of waste. So I'm profiling uh, a young woman named Maria Elena Plomo, who's working with recycled avocado pits that she collects from restaurants in Brooklyn. Uh, and her really beautiful work in uh, the range of colors that the avocado was capable of. Uh, and then we've also got work with invasive species. So I profile a group called um, Avani, who works in the foothills of the Himalayas. And in establishing their workshop in, in the Himalayas, they realize that there is an invasive weed, uh, which they call Eupatorium, but I think it's more, really more Ageratina adenophora. It was a, a imported around the world from central Mexico as a garden ornamental. And it, it's just so terribly invasive. There, there's a record of it during the Great Depression in Australia of actually becoming so virulently invasive that it drove poor farmers off of their land. Wow. It was so you know, prevalent and they couldn't do anything about it. So anyway, this group, Avani, has learned that um, Adiratina adenophora can produce a beautiful range of yellows and olive greens. And so they're systematically eradicating it from big tracts of forest land to give their ecosystem a chance to come back and turning it to good use. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fantastic, right? So all the traditional stuff, but some of these new ideas about, okay, helping the environment, recycling waste, dealing with healing, fascinating extension, I think, of, of what we might once have thought of as traditional natural dying. Constantly, constantly, this is, this is constantly thinking forward while also having 
uh, grounded feet. Like if we're talking about traditional natural dyeing, natural dyeing in general, which is literally a rooted way of doing things. But now, how is our world changing? How can we evolve these ideas forward? These are these are fabulous stories from avocado pits in New York to an invasive species from central Mexico on the other side of the world. Right, fascinating, right? There's another um, there's another moment. I know how passionate you are about Mexico. There, there's another moment where Mexico makes its um, its biology felt on the other side of the world. Um, you have in your mind, of course, all the marigolds that are used as temple offerings in India every day, right? Mm -hmm. Millions and millions and millions of marigold flowers are strung into temple offerings left behind one by one. Such a gorgeous yellow and orange flame colored profusion. Yes. Hindu practices are based in uh, Vedic texts, which are 2000-ish years old, right? Do you know how many times the marigold is mentioned in Vedic texts? <laughs> Zero. Because the marigold only made it to India 350 years ago. Wow. Uh, they said that it was brought there from Mexico um, by the Portuguese. And it caught on because of its showiness and its you know, relative durability, right? You can string it, you can arrange it, you can cover things with it. Uh, it became a serious thing, an adaptation into an ancient culture. Uh, and I find that fascinating. Yes. So the reason uh, that it's in the book at all is that there's a group in Mumbai called Adiv Pure Nature. And uh, Rupa Trivedi is the founder. And it became her idea watching the flowers from the temple be put into rivers, streams, canals, seashores, because tradition demands that you dispose of these things, not as garbage. You have to cast them on the water so that their blessings dissipate back into the universe. She realized that, you know, this is its own sort of holy pollution problem and that there might be better things to do with these things, including making natural color. So she started this amazing atelier in Mumbai um, with marigolds from the temple, hibiscus flowers from the temple, coconut rinds from little food offerings, and she's built up gradually from that base of temple flowers. Uh, a language of 200 color and texture combinations using only pure natural substances. And I love it. I just love, right? This is another way of adapting culture. So we talk about, you know, food making its way through waste into textiles. Well, this is religion making its way through waste into textiles. And she got an approval from the priests of the biggest Hindu temple in Mumbai. It's like, yes, we understand. Just do it. That's so great. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the, uh, what the ear version is of mouth watering, but that's what's going on <laughs> in my ears right now. <laughs> ear watering sounds a little off, doesn't ear it? Ear watering is not how I want to say it, but <laughs> these, are, these are such astounding, beautiful stories, and, 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 and the phrase holy waste, which is wonderful as well. But then taking that holy waste and creating color out of it, taking that holy waste and, and doing something beautiful with it yet again. Yeah, and you know, to finish the story, the, what's left of the petals after the steaming or the, the boiling uh, is turned into compost. And the compost is taken back to the temple and the temple distributes this compost to their, their followers so that the followers can nourish their gardens at home. So oh, it's full circle, good. amazing. Full circle, full circle. If that game could be played everywhere, oh. we'd, we'd be fine. We would be fine, I agree with you. Yeah. Right. This, Again, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything, but there's something here to expand upon. There's something here to build into our, into our days uh, to make us more effective in addressing what we know is a problem. Yeah. yeah. I, I wanna speak for a moment about, um, and this references what we were talking about earlier, that what goes into our clothing, the cheapness of our clothing or the richness of our clothing, and the lessons that old cultures have to share and the way that we can figure out how to incorporate that in our modern world. And as you may know, the sister of Abacuc Avendaño, the shell dyer from Pinotepe de Don Luis, Teresa Avendaño, she died recently. And she is from a village where in the old tradition, women wear a posa wanka, which is a certain kind of sarong-like wrap that is, I consider it to be the, the flag of Oaxaca. Oh, um, so such a beautiful, at once simple, but very beautiful and deeply meaningful piece of textile. It's a wrap that's in the old way of making it is made with cotton that is native to the coast of Oaxaca, made with threads of silk that were brought in by um, 
Spanish conquistadores in the 1500s and then became incorporated into that garment. Those threads of silk were dyed with cochineal red. The bands of blue were dyed with indigo, which was grown along the coast of Oaxaca. And of course, the bands of purple were dyed with purple, which you write about in the book. And all of that creates this textile that speaks about the color legacy of this place in Southern Mexico and the thread legacy and the encountering of two cultures and the way that an indigenous culture took all of those elements and created through generations and dreams something that's absolutely gorgeous, which is the Pozo Huanco worn by the women of that village day in and day out. So and amazing. it is like traditional textiles around the world would have been at some point entirely sourced through what is available nearby or what can be acquired through trade, not yeah. too far away. Right. And what's fascinating about Pinotepa is that they still dress in this. Some of the ingredients that make it have begun to change, but they still dress in this. Sure. Teresa was laid to rest in the traditional way uh, a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. she was dressed in her Pozo Huanco. And they say in Pinotepa that the women uh, weave or are gifted uh, a very fine Pozo Huanco that has the best of colors in it and a wide stripe of this purple, which is the most valuable color. And that one is married and one is buried in their Pozo Huanco. Mm -hmm. And this tradition is being lost, but it isn't lost. Mm -hmm. And she was, she, was, she was buried this way, taking back into the earth these ingredients and these stories that all were born of that land around her. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is absolutely poetic. And... And like you say, we can't go back into doing things the way that our grandparents did, or we may not, we could, I suppose. Our world is a different world. The stories that you're telling me are stories about how some of those old wisdom ways of doing things can be played forward in the world that we're living in. And I feel like there are a lot of beautiful answers and solutions in taking old knowledge, new ideas, and mixing them together. You know, the turmeric shirt and the way that the flowers that came from Mexico and went to India and are now turned into a beautiful cycle of holy offering, yes. holy waste, dye, compost, gift. Yes. It's amazing, right? Yeah. And can I tell you something? As, as I was researching the book and, and writing like crazy, because, you know, every writer leaves things to the last minute, true confession, <laughs> uh, I realized that in my yard in western Pennsylvania, right, I live outside of Pittsburgh, uh, Adjuritina adenophora is also a weed here. And that I, I, I went out and I picked a bunch of leaves and I made a series of hand dyed papers using the yellow imprint of the leaves, using the yellow color of a dye bath. There are things in our backyards that we can start to incorporate into our practice, both from a waste point of view, from an invasive point of view, from a natural occurring windfall point of view. There are things that are not hard to use. We could refresh our clothing. We could make some of our own textiles. Um, you know, let's never use another paper towel again, right? Let's use cotton rags that we dye once a year when something is in season and live with the gradual deterioration of that color across the year because it has its own beauty at every moment. Right. Mm -hmm. There are things we don't have to go to Bed Bath & Beyond, right? We shouldn't go to Bed Bath & Beyond. We should be incorporating more and more of this idea of enjoying the aging of something, of taking advantage of what's close at hand and changing the way we think. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Again, my ears are watering. I'm going to go get a cloth <laughs> towel. <laughs> <laughs> you, you speak of that cloth. I've spent so much time working with potters in southern Mexico, and those handmade clay pots are made to last a while and not forever. That's right. It is it is the nature of their creation, and they are a light they are a light take from planet Earth, right. and they live for a period of time, and they slowly deteriorate, and then they will dissolve back into sand at a certain point, mm -hmm. and our clothing can dissolve like leaves from a tree back into the earth and into the roots and come up again um which are again old ways of doing things and it's a new era when we can do it keith thank you for your time um we you have wonderful projects i'm going to put these in the show notes because if people aren't aware of them hand eye magazine which is a work of art 
a new baby that you're creating, if I'm not mistaken, which is Table. Can you tell me about that just briefly? Yeah, Table, I became editor of a magazine here in Pittsburgh called Table Magazine. And it actually is a, a joining of food and drink and design and lifestyle. And so I'm trying to inject a lot of what we're talking about into you know, the discussion that this magazine holds with all of its articles. And the folk art market too, international right. folk art market, right? One of, one of the greatest events in this country in my mind. Talk about a party of art and amazing people. Oh, it's, it is one of, everybody should come at least once, right? If not yes. every year, it's an amazing yes. Do you have, um, just before we close, the next book in mind, or are you taking a breather? What, what's exciting that's coming up? Oh, I do have the next book in mind, and um, I'm afraid that, uh, that my publisher, your publisher, you know, would have to kill me if I said right now today. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I shut on that one. <laughs> exactly. It is brewing, and I'm, I'm working my way through the outline, right? Because once I have my map, then I know where to go, but I'm, I'm still right. trying the map. But it's oh. going to happen because I, um, I have to say the, the way that people are hearing these stories and the particularly young people, um, there's something good that's happening. There is. And I think um, you know, my next idea can sort of carry, uh, carry something forward there too. There's definitely a growing groundswell yeah. that is moving in the direction that we've been speaking about in this conversation. And it's exciting to be feeling that and to have some grain of salt to add to it. It's true. It's an honor, right? That's, that's Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you for your time, Eric. I really appreciate it. Likewise. Have a beautiful afternoon. You too. Talk to you again. Ciao.